In this video, I'm going to talk about the polythematic texture from George Frederick McKay's book, Creative Orchestration. In that book, he outlines eight different orchestral textures. Today, we're looking at polythematic, and there are seven other videos with these seven other textures. We'll start out by talking about what the polythematic texture is, look at an example from Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony, and then take the Breath of the Wild theme and see if we can orchestrate it using the polythematic texture. To make sure you catch when the rest of the videos in this series are ready to go, please subscribe. So polythematic means many themes. It could be two themes, three themes, however many you might need. But the idea is that you have multiple ideas going on at the same time. It's different from the polyphonic texture because in the polyphonic texture, you had kind of a fabric with a lot of similar ideas and similar timbres all working together to kind of weave this fabric. In the polythematic texture, there is definitely distinction between the different parts. So you should be hearing the separate themes, the separate elements happening in their own way working either together or even against each other. It's also a bit different from the homophonic texture, which is where you have a melody and then chords or an accompaniment underneath of it. Think of that like a singer with a piano player kind of behind them. In the polythematic texture, if you took out what might be your foreground line, your background line still will have some substance to them. They still have some unique elements going on and some interesting parts for the players to play. So I think this will be a lot more clear if we just go straight to an example. This is another one from Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony. This is the second movement. You can see we have three things going on here. In the uh, flute, clarinet, and the French horns, we have this top rising melodic line. In the strings, except for the basses, we have this monophonic texture on this bum ba bum 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 pattern, just going on over and over. And then in the bassoon and in the basses, we have roots and chord tones holding down the bottom. Uh, it's helpful to remember that the bass sounds an octave lower. So even though it looks higher than the bassoon, where it sounds, it's actually uh, down here, it's below the bassoon. And then the basses and the bassoon together are mostly functioning in thirds, really low, really in a place that a lot of people might say violates low interval limits, but here he's doing it and it's working. So you don't always have to follow those rules. Put that back where it was. So let's listen to the three different parts that we have going on. First, we have these woodwinds and brass here on this rising line. Next, we have the violin one, violin two, viola, and cello all playing in a monophonic texture, meaning they're in octaves or unisons on this contrasting theme. And then the last thing we have, like I said, is the basses and the bassoons. So let's just listen to that on their own. So it's very clear that all these three different parts are very different from each other. There's not really an overlapping fabric where they're kind of passing off ideas between each other or one is taking a feature versus another. Part of how he's getting distinction between the three different parts is motivic material. So if you look at the bottom part, the bassoon and the basses, it's um, very simple half notes and the occasional quarter occasional eighth note even, but for the most part, it's very simple and it's in the very low register. Nobody else is interfering. Even the cellos who are very low are not interfering in that register, in that space down there. The strings have this very unique dotted eighth and 16th motive that you don't see in any of the other parts. Uh, even the woodwinds never play that dotted eighth 16th motive. So it's very distinct to the strings and it helps them have their own identity. And then the woodwinds have this rising line that again, we don't see in the strings. The strings tend to stay hovering around this F to this middle C that it stays in that register while the flutes have a very clear upwards trajectory. So there's a lot of distinction between the registers. The winds are very high, the strings are in the middle. The bassoon basses are very low. The motivic material doesn't overlap. They're all doing their own kind of thing. And then the timbres are kept very separated, very isolated. So the string timbre and the high wind timbres never conflict with each other. The, each separate idea is clearly on one timbre or another. There's no blending of like the violins with the clarinets or anything like that. 
The only exception would be the bassoon and the double basses, but they kind of have a similar kind of rough throaty sound in those low registers anyway. Um, so they're kind of close to each other anyway. And again, the ranges being below everybody else keeps any kind of confusion or mess with it. Uh, also notice the French horn waits until this fifth bar here to come in. I've talked about this in a lot of the other videos that use your number of players as a very easy way to help you with dynamics. So when you want to get louder, bring in more people. Bring, he brings in two horns here to build towards this crescendo as the line rises. And also it helps when the line's getting very high, it might become a little kind of off in space isolated by bringing down the horns here on that lower octave will ground it back in with everybody else so it's not just so separated and far away. So let's listen to how these three different parts work together. And again, it's about how they are contrasting and kind of complementing each other, but not necessarily even working with each other. So let's see if we can take that idea and apply it to the Breath of the Wild theme. Uh, again, this one being an intentionally written melodic idea, I think that the main melody, the main theme is going to feature um, and any other parts are gonna be a little more supportive. But I don't want it to just be like chords strumming underneath. I want the supportive part, which may include a lot of the harmonic tones, to at least be aligned to have some sort of its own unique motivic character to it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just throw in a piano here so we can work on a sketch. So I'm going to have to think a little bit. Um, we're pretty familiar with it by this point. So the first thing I'm going to do is maybe just kind of play around and see what is some melodic material I can work with. If you remember in the polythematic video, I was looking for the gaps and I was playing with the same motive. So like here, I kind of echoed in the cello that same opening motive in the second bar. I'm going to avoid doing that here because I want this to be a little different. So what I might do first is maybe actually lay down in a third line, lay down the bass, uh, similar to the Tchaikovsky where he had that kind of third layer in the bases. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to add in the bases. Let's just lay that out very simply. So I know that's gonna be my bottom line. Uh, I could even use passing tones and things as it goes, but the B flat would match here. Um, it's interesting, a lot of what I would use as maybe passing tones, I'm already kind of seeing in the melody, so I don't really wanna copy that so much. So I'm probably gonna avoid that. We could do a C here. And then that goes to a C. Here we could do the B flat, cause that would not conflict too much with and then again, that's the melody note. Leave that as it is. So where we're at so far will just be and let's just bring him down to the nice deep low octave. Let's think about having this guy be a monophonic texture in octaves. It kind of works nicely just in the, in the piano timbre already. So then I know that I have this space here from that very low C, which is down here, up to maybe that middle C, which is up there. I'm kind of working in, in this space a little bit for some sort of other contrasting thematic idea. So... That could be kind of cool. So that was. And then maybe 
we could try to carve out of that. Well, let me keep going with that. And then I'm thinking maybe we could kind of create, um, play with the rhythm a little bit to kind of create a, a, a more interesting motivic idea. So if we kept going on that idea, just kind of grabbing for chord tones that aren't necessarily in the other. Maybe we'd go here. It's a funny chord. I'm not sure what's going on with the A minor 7, because when the A minor 7 hits, it's a very fresh and interesting harmony, so we want to make sure we're kind of respecting that. Instead. That's exactly how it was. So just that before I play with the rhythm. Maybe we could go So now let's think about who could be doing that. I'm starting to think, do I want winds on top? Do I want strings on top? Let's go with violins on the top. Violin, maybe violin and viola. Think about it. And here I'm thinking the trombones. Maybe this is kind of like a medium-ish tempo one. Let's try that. Keep it kind of simple, and then maybe we'll we'll add some things. But let's let's try this for now. So I'm gonna grab grab all of you guys, even though I probably won't use you. And just trombones. 
So I'm going to grab that lower part and give it to trombone. And we're going to just cut it. I'm going to grab the top line of here. And give it to the violin. Boop. Boop. Go back to the lower. Cut this guy out now too. Now, do I want to use the cellos? I thinking the cellos and the trombones could actually function nicely together. So we'll give it a shot. So let's hear what we got. I don't think we need. Uh, the cellos to be doing the trombone thing. Let's put them on the bass line, which will still be below. It will still be like this. I think it was just losing. The bass was kind of so separated. I think that actually putting that on the cellos and the basses will be nice. So let's hear that. I like to have uh, some legato. So I'm going to cut the legato mark there because part of what's working so nicely in the contrast is the um, fact that the string, the high strings are legato and the trombones are not. So let's just keep that a little more consistent. Um, and then what else I might want to do is I think I want to just to make a little smoothness, just to take this a little step further. If we put the flute on the top, just uh, in unison with that top violin part, it's going to add just like a nice little shine to it that you hopefully won't even really hear because it's just a flute. Um, all those violins are going to overcover that. And then maybe a timpani just accenting cadence points. What if we try that? <laughs> great in Sibelius, but it's okay. Let's actually articulate that D flat while we're here. What if we made these guys tremolos too, actually? Would that, would that sound any good? I kind of like that. It has this kind of weird, aggressive thing to the end. So what I'm noticing about this overall, especially with those trombones, this feels darker than some of the orchestrations we've done. Some of them, especially the chordal on the flutes in full harmony, were very rich and, and fluid and nice and warm. And this one to me feels powerful and uh, just has a different character to it, which uh, I think we're getting just because the, the contrast with those trombones. So we have these very severe violins in, and viola in octaves, and then the trombones in a chordal texture, because they're in harmonies, um, just giving a very different stately aggressive character to it. So I'll play it back one more time, and then I think this is about done. So that's the polythematic texture. I think of the eight textures from McKay's book, this is one of the most useful, one that you should be grabbing for a lot. You're gonna hear this a lot in film music where you can have one timbre and one line going one way, another line doing kind of a separate purpose, and you can really use those two interesting contrasting parts to kind of manipulate the scene as it's going along. 
Uh, the main thing is just the contrast. Remember that if you maybe have long notes in one, you have shorts in the other. You have woodwinds in one color, you might have strings or percussion in the other. It's contrast that really makes it feel very rich, even when it's actually very simple. When we wrote that sketch, there were really only three things going on. There was the melody, there was that trombones in the middle on chord tones, and then the bass underneath. It was not really that complicated. You probably could set it up in a way that you could play that with two hands on the piano. But then when we put that into the orchestration and on the instruments, because of that contrast and because the different lines are doing their own thing and keeping your ear engaged, it feels really complex. It feels very rich and full bodied So it seems like there's a lot more going on there than maybe even actually is. So to make sure you don't miss out when the rest of the videos in this series are ready, please remember to subscribe and I will see you in the next one.